Welcome to Pro Sessions in collaboration with the Berkeley Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship. The Recording Academy has launched the series called Pro Sessions to have important conversations and help provide music creators with new insights and tools on how to leverage platforms and help drive sustainable revenue in the new digital economy. Today's session, we're diving into maximizing fan engagement and monetizing your digital audience. Most artists and creators have websites. They're great tools for branding and tour dates and promoting new releases, but how do you really leverage some of these tools that help increase engagement and drive revenue? We're gonna deep dive into that today. We'll speak with today's guests on new approaches on how they've gotten creative with things like tip jars, e-commerce, crowdfunding, and a deeper dive into how to leverage subscriptions. Uh, so first, I wanna welcome Jay Gilbert, co-founder and digital strategist at Label Logic, a label and artist development company. Hey, Jay. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Good, good afternoon. I'm good so thrilled to have you here. Um, Jay and I have long conversations from time to time around what artists are doing. And uh, inevitably, Jay is hip on so, what some artists are doing really differently. And so um, we're thrilled to have you today because we know so important uh, you know, the mindset that we were talking about, it's not just the tools, it's not being afraid to yeah. play. Yeah, there's a lot of great new tools out there. And what I love about this panel today is they're all doing different things. They're trying new things. It's kind of some things they're reinventing, some things are kind of cutting edge, but uh, I'm really excited to get into this. Let's bring on our guests. So the first person that we want to join is um, Dave Cool from Banzoogle. Um, I'll let you introduce Licorice Quartet, guys. Sure. Um, I'd like to say hello to Roger Joseph Manning, Jr., uh, keyboardist, singer-songwriter for the Licorice Quartet, and Tim Smith, hello. Uh, bassist, singer-songwriter for the Licorice Quartet. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to be here. Hey. How's it going? We, Great. We we also have Sav Beist from The Accidentals and Brian Yay. Buchanan from Enter the Haggis. Hey, Sav. Hey, Brian. Hey, it's good to be on. Good to see everybody. Yeah, like you guys could make it. Absolutely. What else would we be doing, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Um, I'd like to just kind of kick this thing off with, with Dave Cool because, first of all, with with Dave, you know, we've never met, but we've certainly been emailing each other. And I'm kind of an evangelist and a fan of what you're doing over at, at Banzoogle. Um, just for, tell us how much money that has been kind of paid through to artists so far uh, from Banzoogle. Sure. And thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here with all these amazing people and, and artists. Um, so Banzoogle, we've been around for 17 years. We've been doing the direct fan thing since 2007 and with our first digital MP3 download store. Um, $64 million worth of music, merch, tickets, crowdfunding, fan subscriptions have been gone directly from fans to the artists through our platform. So $64 million total since 2007, but over 30 million of that is just in the last two years alone. Right, so and you take it, zero commission on that, correct? We take zero commission, it's zero commission. So the transaction, we don't touch it. We just skin it, make it secure, make it look nice. And it goes directly from the fans to the artists. They own that relationship. They own that data. They keep yeah. all the money. Um, and we're just in the background. The fans don't have to create an account with us. It's all, most most fans don't know they're on a Banzoogle website. We just power the back end. It's just a website. What, yeah, what I love about Banzoogle without sounding like a commercial is it's made from musicians it's by musicians for musicians and in fact roger and tim here their their website you know they're they're built on banzoogle and it's what i love about it and i'd love for you to kind of touch on is the functionality is a little bit different than a lot of websites when it comes to these kind of, and I may get this wrong, but like modules, like maybe a Patreon module or a play, pledge music type module or, you know, ways that you can stream, download. You can do the things that musicians need to do from a website. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And that's how we differentiate ourselves. We're a relatively small company. We're privately owned and operated still by the original founding musician. We're all a bunch of musicians at the company. And all the tools and features have been improved and added over 17 years based on the feedback of tens and tens of thousands of musicians. So 
for musicians using a generic platform, they may have to plug something in or tweak it or hack it in some way with our tools. All the, the musician specific tools go a lot further than a generic platform because we're catering specifically to musicians. And, you know, so many of musicians work for our company. And so we get feedback from them and things like the music players that we do sound scan reporting, pay what you want. Uh, you can add lyrics functionality like that just goes a little bit further. Um, and it's a little bit more musician friendly than the, than most other platforms, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to kind of open it up to um, to the musician, singer, songwriters uh, here, because you're all doing interesting things um, during this pandemic. Um, and let, let's start with Roger and Tim. If someone were to go to the Licorice Quartet website, they don't. They're not going to see just the typical. You can buy a T-shirt or a CD. I'd love for you guys to talk a little bit about experiences and, and what that's been like for you, just making the offers, fulfilling the offers, um, and talk a little bit about what those experiences are. Sure. I mean, uh, for me, the fan experiences have been kind of the the ultimate fan engagement. You get to know some of these folks really, really well, <laughs> depending on what. Uh, experience they've uh, decided to purchase. So it's for us, it's been everything from um, playing on other people's song ideas, uh, co-writing ideas with them, um, simple interviews or creating musical birthday greetings for themselves or <laughs> a significant other. And, uh, you know, I, this is not something I woke up one morning and said, oh, this is going to be perfect. You know, that, that my dad wishes I uh, took classes at business school in college, but I didn't, they were all music courses. Um, so th I got a lot of these ideas, uh, from not only working with people like Jay, but just other musicians who'd explored fan funding and crowd sourcing, uh, models before. And it's really just trial and error because the different experiences aren't for everyone. So right. with licorice quartet, we're trying some that worked for me during my pledge campaign and we're experimenting with new ones. And, at the end of the day, we're just going to evaluate which ones have panned out for not only us, but that the fans have really seemed to enjoy and come back for more. I mean, already we're seeing which ones they love and want to do uh, over others. And so it's just work in progress. But I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. And it's been, again, a really incredible way to connect with a fan base that so many of whom have been really, really loyal over the years and, you know, 15, 20 years, and yet now they're finally getting to uh, communicate and go deeper with with artists that they in, enjoy helping out. Yeah, Tim, you've been really involved in rolling up your sleeves and getting in there and communicating with the fans and fulfilling these things. What would you say to an artist out there who's considering doing experiences or kind of diving in? Because it's, it's not for the faint of heart. No, it was uh, very daunting initially. I think, you know, I'm sort of old school in that I think music and musicians have a certain mystique that you don't want to blow <laughs> if you're chatting about mundane things and somebody likes your music for whatever reason that is. So we've had to kind of walk this fine line of engaging in a way where people that are, have been fans, say, of our other past bands or whatever, and take that excitement and give them an experience that is uh, beholden to that, uh, whatever that magical thing was. So at the same time, I still have to go, that's great. You want us to co-write a song. We need to get, you know, exactly what you're talking about. So it's, it's been fun for me because at the end of the day, even if we're doing a birthday song for somebody, for us, it's still super creative because we're not just singing happy birthday. We're, we're recording something unique and interesting that we would, enjoy doing ourselves and like we all are mm -hmm. sitting around with not much going on it's easy to wake up in the morning and get a cup of coffee and sit at my little station and do some creative work even if it's for a 30 second thing um yeah so yeah it's just yeah. it's a fine line gotcha brian we'll get to you in just a second i wanted to ask sav um sav <sighs> You know, <laughs> you, you know, I'm a big fan. You know that during this pandemic, I've probably got to see you more than pre-pandemic. And I'd love for you to talk about some of the things that you're doing, because I think some of them are, are just really amazing. One, the daily breather. Uh, two, I, I really love these ask me anything sessions where you're eating ramen. 
we'll touch on that in a second. And, you know, Bucket Seat Chronicles, whatever. I would love for you to just kind of touch base on some of these things that you're doing because I think they're really engaging for your audience. I know that your fans that I speak with, they're, they're just thrilled that they can see live streams, they can see interviews. But more importantly, you're doing some things outside of the typical live stream stuff. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mostly touch on the live streaming and how we've kind of diversified that um, and Patreon as well. But as a brief overview, I think we have kind of a five step plan of diversifying income, uh, which consists of consistent weekly live stream sponsors, um, educational workshops via Crowdcast for schools. Uh, we do payroll shows via Crowdcast or paywall shows rather via Crowdcast <laughs> um, where that's a ticketed show basically online. Um, we've been doing some session work on the side. And lastly, we've been really growing our Patreon. So uh, what that means is that for the daily breathers that Jay is talking about, we would kind of establish this consistent daily thing where every day at noon Eastern, uh, people would come to expect that we would go live and we would take a 10 minute brief uh break from everything going on we'd light a candle we'd send it all that out to the front lines and we'd play a song recommend a book and um kind of give people a chance to talk about something that they were grateful for in the comments which led to a lot of interaction in the comments and a lot of um inspiration and hope i think at the time another thing that we do now is three for tea which is where once a week we uh, play a couple songs. We feature segments um, that I created for our Bucket Seat Chronicles podcast, which is on our Patreon. And uh, basically, it's just a lot of interaction with people in the comments and really getting them to have a back and forth uh, rapport with you, which is leading into Patreon. That's a lot of what we do there. We do album review clubs where we it, we call them throwback album review clubs, where I think biweekly we talk about a really great album and kind of get other, everybody's perspective via Zoom call uh, with patrons who meet a certain tier. Uh, we also do a monthly book club. So we all read the book together and then we talk about it over Zoom at the end of it. And uh, we do traditions where people drop advice and life experience for us via story that they might have. It's all about um, just connecting with people on a very personal level during this time. You seem more busy now than you were prior with all of these things that you're doing. How do you do it all? Um, honestly, lots of spreadsheets <laughs> and also, um, you know, it's a really collaborative process. We have worked with a lot of other bands, talked to a lot of other people on how to grow Patreon and how to do things. And, um, what we've learned is that it's really important to do what's genuine and what's comfortable to you. I'm a big nerd. All I do is play D and D and teach techie stuff and read books. And, um, I think that those are things that are all, um, entertaining and people can relate to and a certain certain aspects some people can relate to them and it's good to just stick to what is genuine so that way it's fun for you and it's also you know kind of what you do is work yeah uh brian talk to me a little bit about enter the haggis what's different in the way that you're engaging with your audience in this covid era versus before and do you think some of the things that you're doing some of the tools that you're using will you carry those on past the the pandemic sure well uh one thing that i'd never done before uh covid was live streaming through youtube we done we'd done some live streaming stuff through facebook but uh we came up with the idea because as of yet and probably for the uh for the foreseeable future it's pretty much impossible for musicians to actually perform together live over the internet i'm in uh, i'm outside of philadelphia and the rest of my band is in canada so mm -hmm we can't really get together and perform. And so we wanted to stay engaged with our fan base and give them, we, part of the problem for us is that we released an album three days before the lockdown started. Mm. So we've been working on it forever and uh, we had crowdfunded it. We ran a Kickstarter, we were ready to go. We had a launch plan. We had, we're, we're uh, like a Celtic rock band, like an Irish rock band. So March was our album release tour and the plug got pulled March 5th or 6th on the entire tour. And now we're not going to see each other until 2021, I think. So we had to figure out a way of keeping people interested without being able to be on the road and actually pr uh, promoting that new record, the, the traditional way. Um, so I came up with the idea of virtual listening parties. So we did a like a, a live stream listening party for our new album where we listened through the whole thing, pre-recorded some Zoom conversations uh, between the whole band, and then I would cut to short sort of cobbled together video clips and things. Uh, 
over the the audio from the new record and then we would talk about each song and play demos and play you know early mixes and all this stuff and it was so successful and so uh, popular that we decided to go all the way back to 1998 when we released our first record and go through sequentially and just do every two weeks on thursdays we do a throwback thursday listening party live stream and play through the whole record talk about it i've done things like so one of the problems that I had was we did the first couple on Facebook and I started getting copyright takedowns for, for live for streaming. Your stuff? For stuff? music. Yeah. So we're distributed through, depending on the record, either DistroKid or CD Baby. And that stuff is all automated. And they're trying to police live streams and make sure that, that artists are being looked after. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to bad mouth uh, CD Baby here. But halfway through our stream, we would suddenly get shut down. And, the, and on Facebook, the plug would get pulled and there was no way to contest it. And so the first one that got actually shut down in the middle of it, I think we had like a thousand people watching live. And all of a sudden, the plug gets pulled. We had to start a new stream, like the whole thing. And you know, when you're trying to monetize it, and you're trying to build something that's consistent, uh, which is kind of the key. It, it makes you look really unprofessional. So we moved over to YouTube and... Uh, made the decision that rather than trying to use uh, like a Twitch stream or uh, Facebook stars or any of those sort of monetization options, we just put a tip jar on our Banzoogle website. And, uh, and once again, Banzoogle came, came through for us. I think, I think we've been with Banzoogle for 12 years, 12 or wow. 13 years now. So we were, we were kind of early adopters there. And every time we get uh, seduced away to try a tool on another website or a different platform or something, Something goes wrong, something gets gummed up, and we wind up going back to Banzoogle and finding a way to make it work on our website. So that's what we've been doing. And the tip jar thing's been great. They don't take any of our money, and we've been able to sort of scratch out a subsistence for the last few months based on those live streams primarily. Yeah, and you mentioned tip jars. I know, Sav, I'd love to hear, uh, I thought you mentioned one time that you did fairly well with maybe Stage It tip jars. Is that is that right? Uh, you stage it in the past. Most of the time, I create a virtual tip jar through Streamlabs, um, okay. and I add that to an OBS integration. But what's working really well is also paywalls. Right, yeah. and and Roger and Tim, I noticed you know you, you've got a, a tip jar uh, as well. How is that going? You know, that's new for us. Um, it's it's going fine. We don't really quite know how to uh, talk about it so much. People seem to find it and. And we get, you know, really nice little tips in there. So it's cool. I mean, it's, it's the new world for us. Great. Great. So, so how are we doing on time, Lisa? Um, I think we have a couple of questions. So um, oh, good. Uh, quick, Dave, cool. How many um, websites, first of all, this is my question. How many websites do you all manage at Banzoogle? Uh, we power over 50,000 uh, wow. websites for musicians worldwide. Wow, that's awesome. And um, and this is for really for Dave and Brian. Um, so can we dive in just a little bit? You know, unfortunately, Pledge Music um, uh, left us. Um, how, how are you all doing and, and what are people doing during this time around uh, your crowdfunding tools? If you can share just a little bit of that. Yeah, very quickly after Pledge went under, we had been partnered with them for years and we had an integration with them. We never got into the crowdfunding space because of Pledge. And then when they went under, we launched our own crowdfunding tools. Again, it's commission free. It's directly from the fans to the artists. And we're seeing our members raise anywhere from a few thousand bucks to tens of thousands of dollars directly through their websites uh, using that crowdfunding template on, on their you know, directly through their websites. So it's a very different model. Um, we don't get involved again, so it's, really that relationship of trust between the fans and the artists and all that money goes directly into their accounts from the fan account to the artist account. And we're seeing artists, whenever I'm at a conference, inevitably a few artists will come up to us and say, Hey, we use your crowdfunding. We raise X amount of money. We love it. Like we have full control. There's no one holding our money. There's no, you know, we're actually getting paid. So that's been really great. It's, it's new for us. We're kind of new to the scene, but Again, the commission-free aspect, and we do sound scan reporting, which was a big thing that Pledge Music had that a lot of, obviously, labels and artists found to be important. So we also do that as well. So we're going to keep adding to that uh, that tool as time goes on. Yeah, uh, we 
we crowdfunded the first record that uh, first record we ever crowdfunded was in 2010, I think. It was an album called White Lake, and we did that just through our Banzoogle store before there was even Banzoogle integration for real crowdfunding tools. Um, I think it was really before Kickstarter even kind of became like the Kleenex of crowd crowdfunding, you know. And wow, it was amazing for us because, as Dave says, they didn't take any commission and. Uh, we we sort of we we hired a couple of people to help us with the back end stuff. Um, so we since then we've done a, a Kickstarter and then we went to Pledge Music and we had a Pledge Music campaign that went very well. And then once Pledge Music went under, we went back to Kickstarter mostly just because some of the back end stuff. But I'm sure by the time the next record comes around, we're going to be back on Banzoogle again doing it. So uh, it's it's once again it's amazing to see. Uh, uh, I know I just sound like a fanboy, but, <laughs> but but seeing these guys kind of sit back and sort of see where the holes in the market emerge, and and not just sort of absorbing those those functions, but improving on them, and taking comments from people who have tried everything else and and, and dug deep. Like I've written a few letters to either Dave or Chris or, or people at Banzoogle with my suggestions for things that could be integrated that I found on other websites or things that I'm unhappy with from other websites. And they actually, you know, they actually respond to the email. And then a few months later, you actually see your suggestions being in- implemented. So it's, uh, it's great. Again, yeah, this is just my family. You're right. our best product tester, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> we take, we take your feedback very seriously. I'm good at breaking the website. <laughs> That's awesome. I know I know. Sav had talked a little bit about live streaming and, and in Pro Sessions 1, we um, talked about Twitch and um, Stage It. But for those of you who are using tip jars, any tips for other artists on how to do it? I know that sometimes people are hesitant about putting tip jars up, but what a great way to leverage... Um, even Instagram and YouTube and, and Facebook. And I, I know, sadly, there's probably not a direct in- integration, but even just putting the links there, any other any other tips on how to leverage them? Well, very quickly, I'll just say that I know that there's been a stigma for a long time. I mean, it feels like begging. It feels like soliciting. Um, but I think in today's music industry, the fact that uh, so many of the middlemen are getting eliminated. I think that fans are becoming more and more aware of and more and more forgiving of the idea that we're now our own music labels. We're now our own publicists. We're our own promoters. In a lot of cases, we're our own booking agents. And so any way of getting the money to go direct from fan to the musician, it doesn't feel like, uh, it, does, it doesn't feel gross. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're begging. It feels just like, you've eliminated the friction between the artist and their fans. And I think people really enjoy that interaction. I agree with that. I think you want to support the bands that you love. All of the bands that I love, whether I work with them or not, I buy their new record when it comes out. I buy their merch. I want to support them, you know, and I think it shows that you, you know, that you believe in that artist and you want to support them and listen, we're not making the same revenue, nor should we from a CD or a vinyl album. You know, those experiences are different than a download and then downloads are going away. And now we have streaming and that's paying even less. And you have YouTube, which is paying even less. Um, So the artists are still generating this great music and we want to support that and keep that going. And I think it's very respectful. I don't think it's pandering. I don't think it's begging at all. I think it gives me an opportunity to kind of give back. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're going to talk a little bit about mindset in a second when when Sherry and the, the rest of the team join. But I also think it's really important to remember that these fans right now aren't able to go out and see you all live. And so to be able to, um, you know, catch a couple songs and, and support as they would if they were going to see you in a live situation um, you know, should never be you. No one should ever be fearful of that. Um, you know, wh- one of the things about these conversations is really to um, you know talk about that that entrepreneurial mindset and it's never been more important than now for creators to really achieve their value and there's lots of of fans who want to see you perform on a day-to-day basis and I'm sure who'd be thrilled to you know throw a couple dollars in the in the virtual tip jar Um, Dave before we go on on this segment um Anything, any other new tools coming out? Anything else on, on tip jars? Um, yeah, the tip jar is relatively new. Uh, once the pandemic hit, we threw our roadmap out the window. We, we released uh, live stream ticket sales, so commission-free 
ticket sales for live streams, uh, the tip jar, and now we're getting back. We're retooling all of our e-commerce features, actually, which is very relevant to this conversation. So in the next few months, Jay, Brian, and others are going to see huge improvements to the back end for all the e-commerce tools, more tools for the crowdfunding, more tools for fan subscriptions, all that. So that's our big focus uh, through the rest of this year. We had to take a bit of a break from that roadmap, obviously, um, in the last few months, but we're getting back to it now. That's great. Awesome. Well, I want to transition out. First of all, I want to thank all of you um, for this first segment. Um, and I do want to um, introduce Sherry Hugh. Um, Jay, thank you so much for taking the time today and, and hanging out with us. And Honor Roger and, and Tim, thank you. Um, much appreciated. Yeah. Um, I do want to bring in Sherry. Um, she uh, a, is going to talk really do more of a, a deep dive into subscription because it's new and talk a little bit about um, doing it on Patreon versus doing it on your own site. You know, what's the, the, your websites are a brand. Should you be doing it there? Should you be looking at both? And how do you really bring in um, subscribers and fans to do more than music? And I also would love to introduce you to uh, TK uh, TK is uh, um, an amazing drummer, um, part of the band Southern Avenue, and most recently a solo artist coming out with some new music, um, and also a member of the Recording Academy Memphis chapter. So um, welcome, TK. Hello, how's it going? Good. Pleasure to have you today. I'm happy to be here. Very excited. I've been enjoying everybody and all the, the great things is very informative. And also you guys look very lovely and yeah. <laughs> well, Sherry, I'm gonna leave it to you because there's a, the, uh, one of the most amazing things be, beside your um, being a um, an advocate and expert around music and tech is that you have a Patreon. Yeah, um, yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you everyone for having me. I'm super excited for this conversation um, in part because yes, I, do have some of my own experience dealing with these platforms. So um, as a brief summary of what I'm up to right now, I run my own newsletter and community uh, dedicated to music and tech called Water and Music. And um, for now I'm running it on Patreon and I've been doing that for a little over a year. Um, and now there are a bit over 600 members, um, which is a really good group. And so it's been really interesting because I've, I've like written some articles in the past about uh, like artists who are using Patreon and embracing paid memberships. And so um, it's great to kind of compare that to um, how Patreon might work for someone like myself who's on the media side um, or for any other creators as well. And um, yeah, so I, I'd actually love to start um, from there. Um, I'd love to open this question to, uh, to the group, but it's about Patreon and um, paid memberships in general. Um, I think just one mis common misconception, I don't know if uh, people in this group would agree, um, about agree with this, but I think a lot of people group Patreon with Kickstarter and treat it as a crowdfunding platform, but um, I think it's really something much deeper. I think in general, uh, the paid membership model is much deeper because it's not a limited time campaign that you're dealing with. You're dealing with recurring subscription and then from the artist side, having to um, deliver recurring value or to at least like post things more frequently to, to your Patreon or membership page. Um, and so I would love to dive into the mindset that is required to um, run a membership experience successfully, um, whether on Patreon or any other platform of your choice, uh, because in, in my mind, it's quite different from, um, I, I think, how you would approach a traditional album release, for example, um, where you're targeting bigger streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple Music. Um, yeah, I don't, um, Sam, I know you have a Patreon page, so I don't know if there's anything yeah, that comes to mind for you there. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um... As far as mindset when growing and building a Patreon, um, like I said earlier, I think it's about basing it on the genuine version of yourself because people are coming to sort of get a behind the scenes experience of what it's like to be a creator. A lot of these people are creators or striving to be creators and having a Patreon helps them be part of the process. Um, so in that way, I feel like it's different than crowdfunding because crowdfunding is more about um, garnering enough money to do a certain project and Patreon is like an endless creative project or a series of creative projects that you do with people and supporters who are lifelong supporters oftentimes. Um, mm. So that would be the mindset to go into and I also think um, going off of that it's like having a, a conversation of sorts with people um, going in I think 
like for Patreon, and this is a learning curve for me, it's less about yourself all the time. And it's more about like asking questions um, or doing AMAs and getting people's answers or doing things like traditions and getting people's stories and then either being inspired by that or just having a conversation about it. That's a really useful aspect of Patreon. Mm. Great. Yeah, I definitely uh, felt the same way in terms of like the community aspect being a super important part of it as opposed to just the one directional um, yet kind of conversation as well. Um, TK, just as a, a matter of like more like background and context, are um, I guess what is the scope of like what you're up to right now? Uh, do you have any like subscriptions that you're involved with as yeah. well? Or yeah. Um, so my band Southern Avenue, we we were on the road consistently for like the last five years, and then we were brought home obviously due to the p- pandemic. And so immediately when we got home, we all were like Patreon came across the table, and it was very. Um, I'm sorry. It was very new for us um, in terms of just moving online to solely online for uh, performing and connecting with fans um, on a monetary uh, level. And so the cool thing that happened was that we have such amazing fans that we kind of established this relationship from touring. So where we, you know, we'd seen them in person and everything. And when all of this happened, everybody kind of felt, felt for the musician community. And so people were asking like, how can we still support? How can we do this? How can we do that? And fortunately, we just started pushing Patreon and we sat down um, as a band, as a group, and we just threw in ideas as to how we can make this work for us. So kind of like Sav was saying, doing being true to yourself and doing something that's comfortable for you. Well, um, my sister, she has two kids and she's been homeschooling them as well. And so she's kind of uh, dove into connecting with fans who have kids, I guess you could say and kind of uh, relating, you know, kind of just bringing that aspect of our lives um, to a tangible form for people. And also in general, we've been doing more live uh, streams with uh, partnerships and different festivals that aren't doing the festivals, you know, because of the same reason. So um, it's been cool to be able to not only do these virtual live streams, but we've kind of set up a second camera to record like uh, behind the scenes stuff. And so that's also a version of, of content. So it's kind of just like uh, anything that we find interesting or fun. And another way is the tears or like the things that you give to people when they subscribe. And so I like to paint and I decided, okay, why don't I do a painting specifically for the Patreon subscribers? Mm-hmm. And so we have, if you subscribed at a certain amount, you would get the actual painting. And if you subscribed at a lower tier, you could get a print. And so we're still going through our bugs and like learning cu- learning curve, I guess you could say. Um, but it's been really cool. And people have been very supportive also working with us because we did go through a time where we were just not motivated, you know, and kind of down, mm-hmm. but uh, to see other people post and to see our peers and to see everybody going so hard, it was definitely another push. And so I think in general, like the whole reason we do this in the first place is because we love music, we love to perform. And those, those 30 minute live um, sessions that we do as a band give me so much life, let me tell you. So I think, that aspect of being able to perform as a musician, perform still as a musician um, is what keeps us going. But also the idea that there's just so, there's this huge world of, uh, of what do you call it? Of a way to connect with the fans where even though we're not at a physical show, they can still pay for music or they can still pay for a performance. And also kind of get more out of it because we're on a personal level. Like, just like right now, a lot of us are speaking um, to each other from our homes. Whereas before you would only see artists and musicians kind of on stage or in a certain setting. So I think it's opened up a lot of people to feel more comfortable to reach out to musicians and kind of have this new way of connecting. And so that also kind of inspires me too, because they get excited, I get excited. And next thing you know, it's a party online and we're drinking and nobody has to drive. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, that's really great. One, um, yeah, another like really important takeaway from just listening to what um, what you were saying is that, the, I guess, yeah, when you're setting up your membership on on any platform or like Patreon um, specifically and thinking about what to put in different tiers, um, it definitely does not only have to be related to music. Um, I think especially in this time when everyone's um, stuck at home and is 
yeah, to an extent craving like more of this connection, the more humanity you can bring, I think to the table, the better. And so hearing that like you're offering these paintings, um, I know a lot of, yeah, there. I mean, there are so many uh, multi-talented interdisciplinary artists who don't just make music, but also are super into visual art, maybe other kinds of art. And um, so there is a way to, yeah, like package all of that into one membership experience as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one question that comes to mind, and uh, this question is related to Dave, I'm really interested in hearing your, your perspective on this as well, is um, choosing which platform exactly to build um, a membership or similar experience on. So um, Sab, TK, and I, I guess we're all building on Patreon and um, yeah, I would love to exchange thoughts on, on why um, we chose Patreon over, I think a growing number of other competitors for um, building a similar membership model as well. Yeah, for sure. I can't really speak to, I'll just speak to Ben Zugel's perspective. Like mm -hmm. obviously Patreon has become synonymous with that patronage model, um, sort of like Kickstarter did with, with crowdfunding to a certain extent. You know, for us, our perspective is, again, the way we differ from Patreon would be that, and for all Ben Zugel, Zugel mem members watching this, like it's built in already. So you can run an online fan club fan subscriptions directly through your website. And so you're driving your fans to the property that you own, your domain. Um, they don't have to sign up with Banzoogle to give you the monthly donations. They sign up with you directly. So you own that direct relationship with your fans and all that monthly recurring revenue goes directly from the fan to the artist. So we don't take a commission. It's directly through your website. And, and with Banzoogle, like we just power the back end if an artist decides to leave Banzoogle for whatever reason, they take their domain, they take their data, they take their content and they take it with them. So we encourage artists to drive fans to that property online, that little slice of the internet that they own and control and that they control the brand of it. And so that they have that direct relationship with the fans. So that's, that's kind of where we're coming from and how I guess we would differentiate ourselves from other uh, membership type platforms. Mm -hmm. And is there, is there uh, the ability to have multiple membership tiers? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So it's actually okay. super flexible. And so you can do the traditional like membership tiers, but you can also gate just various pages on your website if you want. You can really set it up how you want. We have a wizard that walks you through to set it up more traditional, like two or three tiers or more. Um, but you can really make it uh, quite complex if you want or very simple. We have a lot of artists who are just, you know, one tier, you know, five bucks a month to support them. We have other ones who go everywhere from $5 to $200 a month. And they do like art prints and paintings and, and all sorts of amazing, incredible um, ways to connect with their fans and offer their fans value in exchange for that, that monthly support. And, you know, we're seeing artists on our platform raising anywhere from a couple hundred bucks a month to several th thousands of dollars a month through these online fan clubs. So it's really, it's really incredible to, to see how creative artists are and how they're using the tools to uh, really engage directly with their fans, offer value, and then, you know, make that recurring income, especially um, given the pandemic right now. Mm. Yeah, and uh, yeah, this next question is more for um, TK and Sav uh, and kind of the overarching idea I'm thinking about now related to all of this is um, what I think is a really great and long overdue conversation about how artists like value their work and like price their work online. Because I think um, the concept of a membership has, has been around for as long as fan clubs, like paid fan clubs have been around, but I think it's definitely um, getting more into the public and industry consciousness in, over the past couple of months. Whereas previously, I think thinking about digital value, so much of the conversation used to be on streaming or maybe on, on digital downloads. But um, I mean, one thing with a multi-tier membership is, is even that the fact that you're able to set those multiple tiers um, and you have a wider range of pricing that, you know, like that fans can like buy into to access the membership experience. And so, um, yeah, I would love to hear your, your perspectives on, um, your thought process about uh, figuring out what tiers you wanted to offer, like how many tiers and kind of what the range was um, for pricing. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so when we sat down to brainstorm um, in general about what we could offer the fans, we also, the second step was deciding, okay, um, as far as we, what we could offer for them to subscribe to as far as content, the second thing was um, rewards and stuff. And so we kind of, 
broke it down um, by what's easiest for us and what's the hardest thing for us that we're willing to do, then financially, how much would that cost us? And then also uh, probability, like who's going to subscribe for like $200 versus $5 or $15. Mm-hmm. And so all kind of already knowing our fans, uh, a lot of our fans um, are older, a part of the an older demographic. And so they may be able to afford more of this. And so, okay, I thought to myself, like, um, we thought to ourselves, um, what what do people want to do? What or not? What do people want to do? But I guess for an example, one of our options, if you subscribe at a certain tier, you could pay for a concert in your living room. But this is obviously after everything is over and things get better. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, there's like I've heard about the curbside thing that's going on right now. So it's kind of a uh, similar to that where people can pay a certain amount of money to have us drive to you and since we're not doing anything obviously um it would be like the ultimate gig for us <laughs> but uh i guess it just came down to i feel like uh i don't want to keep saying uh but um it just came down to like what we could actually do ourselves from our homes mm-hmm. and from our living rooms and um so guitar lessons drum lessons bass lessons we've been able to do that we've been able to also in in general uh connect different uh our more of our platforms because you also have like you don't want to do everything and then release it on multiple platforms so like patreon youtube facebook instagram and stuff like that so we said okay if we have patreon fans subscribed here then we'll do this content exclusively for them and so uh, i think it's just a combination of uh your capability and how creative you're willing to be and um consistency is also a big deal i'm learning too that you don't have to every video doesn't have to be a whole five minute song of you playing your heart out with the best guitar solo drum solo or whatever it could honestly be uh my sister and i we've done videos where we kind of just talk about things on the road stories on the road or just in general ask fans questions about uh everyday things and yeah, I'm rambling. <laughs> no, but uh, it's all great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's what I got. That's what I got. <laughs> no, yeah. So, yeah, super interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, Sab, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, TK pretty much covered everything I had. I have a resource written out that kind of demonstrates some of the things that we do. Uh, Patreon.com slash The Accidentals. Uh, we do like a lot of different things. Um, but I think like it goes from five to a hundred. It's five dollar, ten, twenty, fifty, and a hundred. And it starts being pretty, um, I would say, like, ec- inclusive. Like, there's lots of uh, video content. There's um, a lot of, there's podcasts that I do uh, once a month for the $5 people. And then for $10, we do, like, a weekly tour blog where it's more intensive. Uh, we do Ask Me Anything. That's an AMA. I'm sorry. I got some comments asking what an AMA was. It's Ask Me Anything. So <laughs> just put out a question, and we talk about it in the comments. Um, and we do live streams specifically for ten dollar that are like choose your set list. Then at twenty dollar we do like live streams where we're just gonna wing whatever song you throw at us. So it's more intimate by twenty dollars. <laughs> You're seeing like the raw sides of the accidentals. Um, and we do our book club, so that's even more intimate. Um, and by the time you hit a hundred, we're at like really intimate where we're doing throwback album reviews every week, and we are doing face to face sessions and just really. I think it's a matter of like TK said. Uh, what is manageable for you, what is comfortable for you, but also about intimacy. Mm. You guys, yeah, and- um, I have a couple questions that um, have come through. Um, uh, one of the things that I've had um, a couple people ask over time is, and and we should probably by, probably, by the way, explain what subscriptions are. I think we, we kind of assumed that people knew what they were. Um, a subscription is basically a fan club. It's it's an old-fashioned fan club in a digital environment that people are subscribing to and getting something back on a monthly basis. Um, but a lot of of creators have said they're a little afraid because they they feel like they have to make a commitment to actually play music consistently on it. So I know Sav, you talked a lot about so many amazing things that you do. But Sorry. TK and and Sav, what percentage of your um, your gives or your offerings on your subscription are actually playing music versus non-music and some of the other creative things that you're doing. Um, Sav, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, <laughs> <I'd> say, 
<laughs> we're just passing it back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, um, I think honestly, the, the most amount of music that we really give right now, uh, because we're recording our album, we're doing like some studio talks. We have a videographer doing some behind the scenes footage at this point. Um, so there's some of that content that's kind of teaser content um, regarding the upcoming album, uh, which is situational. But I think in regards to like before we were recording the album, how much were we giving away musically? I think we were doing a lot of live streams for the 10 and 20 tiers, um, once a month live streams. And then for the rest of it, it's more about getting into the details of why we write. One of the first things that we did, which I think is super important, is we put out a poll to our patrons once we had a pretty strong base and we were asking like, what do you want to hear from us? Do you want to hear us play D&D? Do you want to hear us like talk about the songwriting? Should we like talk about other musicians albums? Like what do we do? And the people who were on our Patreon really wanted to hear about the songwriting process and how we got these songs built. So we created a podcast around that. And a lot of our questions have to do with that. And um, that we kind of built our whole Patreon around the process. Uh, but it's subjective. It's about who is your demographic? Who's your audience? Ask them uh, what they want to hear from you. Why are they there? Um, and that'll help establish your game plan. And, you know, you can start thinking, okay, well, how are the things that I like to do going to combine with this thing? Oh, I really like listening to podcasts. Let's make a podcast about the songwriting process, ETC. Awesome. I love the fact, I love the idea that you surveyed your, your fans, you know, um, it, it's uh, rather than guessing what they want, may as well just ask them. TK, what percentage <laughs> of the time that you're on um, your Patreon or your subscription service or fan club for people who are new to it is spent uh, just playing music for them versus other things? Well, a lot of our content in the beginning was um, our original songs, um, acoustic versions of them, and a lot of cover songs that we knew. And then eventually we would get recommendations for this and that because we would go live on our Facebook and talk to people to get people to come to Patreon. So we would ask them on Facebook there what they wanted to listen to. And so as things as time went on, that's when we got more comfortable to venture out to um, other material and stuff like that. And like. Um, I have, I used to vlog with the band and so I have all of this footage that I did nothing with. And so that's also another thing that I want to release where we do, uh, where we talk to the fans kind of about a situation that's happening on video or kind of have this like live connection with them uh, about life on the road and, and stuff like that. So we try, I think being able to talk, you know, you don't always have to play music. I think in general, just being able to be here with somebody it's so valuable within itself. Um, so anytime you can create a, a, con a subject matter where you can talk about it, like Steph said, I think that's like, that's what we're trying to do more of now. We've done a lot of the music, um, song covers and originals and this and that, and people love it and we can do it easily, but uh, it's, more, it's also more fun to try other, uh, try and reveal other parts of ourselves that they haven't necessarily seen and converse about it. That's awesome. Can we do a rapid fire? One do, one don't for subscriptions, for fan subscriptions. Any, uh, any Anyone want to start? What's one do and one don't? Ooh, let's see. Sav, Dave, <laughs> Jerry, all of you. <laughs> Good question. Don't, don't give up. Hey, there we don't go. give up. I was going to say, don't I don't really think there's like a don't, you know? It's like a matter of trying things and like trying to figure out who are you talking to? You know, you don't know until you try. So don't yeah. stop trying. <laughs> and by the way, I think that's a do. Survey your 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 fans and find out what they're uh, willing to do. One of the greatest stories from our first um, pro sessions was um, one of the artists shared that someone said, hey, why don't you go show them how you do your warm up exercises for your vocals? Because he's got a really high range. And he's like, why would anyone ever want to see that? And they did. Maybe don't yeah. leave them hanging is a is a good one. Um, if you're going to put out a bunch of content, the, like you can schedule posts ahead of time. You can do like a week's long worth of scheduled posts. But, you know, the, the conversation is meant to be had. Um, so I would I would say don't leave them hanging. Go in and say hi. And they're awesome people. I mean, I love I know personally and love everybody on our Patreon at this point. That's just kind of the relationship that happens. And uh, one of the things I wanted to kind of backtrack on is that Patreon is also really collaborative. Um, so you can bring different like other people on patreon for instance like tk if you and i were to do like a collaboration if i played violin on any of your music we could both share that same video to our patrons or like have yeah. it only on one patreon page and then another songs on the other patreon page and redirect people to those two things so that's a really collaborative amazing thing that i feel like people are really craving right now is the 
is the interaction. Please let us yeah. know if that ever happens. We we want <laughs> we, we, we we definitely we want to be connect. there. <laughs> um, Sherry, any do's and don'ts? Yeah, um, I I like finally thought of one for each. So for do, I would say. Um, this is specific to Patreon, I guess, because that's what I'm most familiar with, but um, take advantage, do take advantage of the fact that fans and like paying members can also interact with each other. Like it's not just about like the artist to fan kind of like one directional interaction. Um, so, and Patreon has a lot of integrations that can, I guess, facilitate this community more. Probably the, the most popular example is Discord. So for every Patreon membership, you can integrate it with the members only Discord server which for those who aren't familiar, it's um, it's it's like a more informal version of Slack. Um, it's many of similar features and there are a lot of features that come with the free version. And so I have one for my membership and that's been probably like one of the biggest uh, sources of value for members um, for my newsletters, like getting to talk with each other in the Discord server, not so much about me just posting to them. Um, in terms of a don't, I think uh, it's important with any kind of paid membership experience. Um, going back to, I think uh, TK, you're talking about like really keeping things exclusive um, is also just to not uh, post things on your Patreon or membership page that you would otherwise just post on Instagram anyway. Um, I think if you do want to uh, start a membership experience and like really grow it out, you do have to kind of segment. Um, yeah, you, don't, you do have to segment the experience properly because then otherwise uh, from the fan perspective, they're thinking, um, oh, I might, I might, I might as well just get this, get this on Instagram for free. Why do I have to shell out more money? And so just like really thinking more carefully about the additional value add, which, um, yes, may require more work, but not that much more if, if the materials that you're going to release, like are already baked into your creative process in some way. That's, that's awesome. I know, um, unfortunately these, uh, go by so fast and we're running out of time. Um, I, I, I um, urge all, encourage all of you to follow TK and Sav and Sherry um, uh, online and on their Patreons. Um, and also for Recording Academy members who may be watching, um, Banzoogle offers a special discount to Recording Academy members. Dave, if you want to just um, share that really quickly. Sure, yeah, it's just the promo code Grammy. Um, you enter that when you sign up for a free trial, you get a, an extended six month free trial and a 15% discount off any of the subscription plans. TK, I already changed your free trial to the Grammy <laughs> member benefit. I saw you created a trial recently, so I added that to your account. Thank you. So yeah, plenty of time to build a website, but yeah, just the promo code Grammy. And um, and and we have also a Sav. We put up your um, your 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 latest document. You're so amazing at creating these tip sheets. Um, if you want to just give a quick plug for that, it is on Grammy.com forward slash pro sessions on yeah. how to uh, five way five ways to uh, to generate revenue. Is that what it is in 2020? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I forget what um, I called it. <laughs> uh, and so thank you guys. I do want to bring in um, our partner in all of this, um, Nicole from the uh, from Berkeley's Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship. Again, this would have never happened without um, the the partnership with Berkeley and our, our like mindset on making sure that, um, you know, creators really are entrepreneurs. And so... Um, Nicole, if you'll join us on and thank you all. I want to say thank you to Jay Gilbert and Dave Cool from Banzoogle and um, Roger Manning and Tim Smith from Licorice Quartet and Brian Buchanan from Enter the Haggis, um, Sav, Sherry and TK. And um, hopefully we have Nicole, are you with us? I think I am. Can there you, you are. See me? Hey, hey. hey. Um, I really enjoyed the session. I found it so interesting. And um, yeah, thank you all the guests. It was fascinating just to hear the the topics. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, this session is such a perfect example of sort of our um, credo at, at the Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship at Berkeley College. Um, you know, it's interesting to see all these artists that most people know as like performers, sharing this entrepreneurial side and like, you know, there are spreadsheets and, um, you know, all of these like really thoughtful ways of thinking about the content. Um, that's sort of a big part of our ethos is just that, you know, every artist's career is a startup, but also that in going through this artistic creative process that most artists have been doing for decades, um, they've sort of gained these inherent 
entrepreneurial skills and ways of thinking. And so um, it's no surprise that they're sort of naturals in thinking about how to apply this. And I would encourage all of sort of the the smaller artists that were watching this and asking questions of like, you know, how do I gain a following or how do I um, start connecting with people? I think that, um, you know, we heard from TK and from Zav, like just start trying things, start putting your work out there, asking questions and, and staying close to your customers. And it's what, you know, clearly like it's what Banzoogle has done to be successful. They've listened to their customers and stayed close to those artists. And it's what the successful artists are doing as well. So um, yeah, I really enjoyed this. Um, we have some more sessions coming up soon, Lisa, I believe, right? Yep, we do. We have, um, we have three more sessions and we'll, we'll post those up here uh, soon. And yeah, you know, I, to your point, Nicole, um, social media is a, an amazing platform to, to build and communicate with audiences. But I think it's so important for um, all creators to, you know, really leverage their brand and to test out some of these new tools and technologies. Um, I think reinventing uh, fan clubs and, and all of the things that we talked about today are, are really great opportunities. Um, uh, we'll we'll pop up the um, some of the upcoming events and for anyone who wants to follow or and get notifications on upcoming processions, visit grammy.com forward slash processions. Nicole, do you want to just that. tell anything quickly about um, Berkeley Institute of Creative Entrepreneurship before we go? Um, well, we always have, um, for those artists that are looking to expand sort of how they see themselves as entrepreneurs, we do have online courses, both um, free massive open online courses or MOOCs, as well as um, for credit paid classes on Berkeley Online. So I know everybody is at home with extra time on their hands. So if you go to berkeley.edu backslash ICE, I-C-E, um, there's information there on the various like events and experiences um, and some really interesting ways to get involved. So yeah, please check that out. Some great courses and um, thanks. Looking forward to the next couple of sessions and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye everyone. We'll see you on the next pro session. Thanks. Take care.